welcome back, everyone. This is Radio Free Market, and I'm going to hand the, uh, the next question over to you, Mr. Aaron Brown. All right. So right before the break, we, we had briefly talked about how minimum wage laws, uh, among other things, make the situation worse uh, as a government interference. Uh, can you give us a, an example of why, it's, why this is so? I've actually been reading some of your stuff on the minimum wage law. So why would a minimum wage law, which is supposed to raise everyone's living standards, why does this actually do the opposite? Basically what it does is it takes people who are not very productive and it prices them out of the labor market. So we mentioned the way that we frame economic policy questions a little bit ago, and, and people like a policy that says, okay, you're not allowed to pay people less than $7.25 an hour. If we rephrased that and said, okay, impoverished person, you're not allowed to work for less than $7.25 an hour, I think people might react to it, might react to it somewhat differently. Firms that are out there seeking profits, and that's presumably everybody, or presumably all firms, or anyone, what they're going to do is they're going to try to hire as many hours of labor as are worth whatever the prevailing wage happens to be. So if you can only produce $7 an hour worth of stuff, and the minimum wage is $7.25 an hour, you find yourself out of work, or you find yourself completely out of luck. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, one of the, the best books that I've read is Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt, and he said, just like you said, he creates a, a permanent sector of unemployment as opposed to uh, raising people's living standards. Right. So, okay, so, so we're going to go on to uh, the eighth principle, Aaron, if you would. All right. So the eighth principle, uh, you talked about how profits, they, it's actually a signal. It tells businesses that they are taking resources and they're doing something good with it because people want it. People give up their hard-earned money and their labor uh, for it. So how does, um, you know, the example of, let's say, uh, two shoemakers, you know, one shoemaker uh, offers, uh, he's efficient and he offers shoes at a, people, a price that people want, and the other shoemaker uh, doesn't. He's inefficient and so he... Uh, prices of shoes too high, so people don't like it. Uh, so how does, how does the example of the shoemaker show that the person who is going bankrupt, how are they wasting resources? Basically what, what, what happens when a, when a firm earns a profit, they take factors of production, labor, capital, raw materials, and land, and all this other stuff, that people have expectations about what all of this stuff can produce. And the producer who earns a profit takes all of this stuff and shows that everybody's expectations were wrong. In fact, actually, all of this can be used to produce something that is more valuable. So in the case of uh, um, you know, you, you, the shoemaker, the really, really good shoemaker, who, let's suppose, produces absolutely amazing shoes, um, he shows that everything that can go into shoemaking can, in fact, be used to make better shoes than, every, than, than everybody thought before, and he's going to be rewarded for his foresight. Um, <clears throat> If someone, well, you know, if I'm going to have to interrupt you here. Art. I'm going to have to ask you to make a comment on the ninth principle, or we're not going to have time to uh, even discuss it at all. Uh, unfortunately, we're coming to the end here. And uh, we have Henry Hazlitt's great summation of economics. We shouldn't ignore the long-term and unintended consequences of policies and actions. In as few seconds as you can put it, how would you uh, uh, like to comment on that? One of the great lessons of economics is that meaning well is not sufficient for doing good. You have to actually understand a few things about how the world actually works. And if you don't take seriously the idea that people respond to incentives, that people act, that transaction costs matter, and that trade creates wealth, then uh, you're engaged in what Sheldon Richman refer, or, uh, yeah, what Sheldon Richman referred to as the intellectual equivalent of drunk driving. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Art Carden and Mr. Aaron Brown, for being with us today. Thank uh, you for having me. Yes, very greatly appreciated. So we'll have you back again, and we'll be able to talk about these a little bit more the next time, I'm sure. This is Michael McKay and Radio Free Market. Please visit us on the web at RadioFreeMarket.com, where you can download this and all of our shows for free. And until next week, folks, wherever you are, please stand up for freedom. Thank you for listening.